I know my farm is not going to change the world, but if all of us do a little bit, we can. And, it, you know, sometimes that little bit is just about being aware about where your food cr- comes from and making the effort to support a system that is, um, that is going to help the ecology rather than supporting a system which is plundering our, our, our ecology. What if we could actually make a difference to climate change? Filmmaker Rachel Ward felt as impotent and horrified as any of us watching and being impacted by the Black Summer bushfires. Then she realised her New South Wales hobby farm might be a site of change and action. Her journey to regenerative farming is chronicled in a new film, Rachel's Farm. And we are so lucky to have Rachel with us today. Welcome to Dirty Linen. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely intro. You've said it. I can just go away now. <laughs> well, you better not because we've, it's, yeah, because we're so happy to have you here with us to take us through this story. I, I've, um, I think the film is beautiful. It's very hopeful. It shows that um, there is there are things that we can do. But tell us, tell us from your perspective, how did this all begin? So from the beginning, well, the beginning was, I suppose, just, you know, the constant frustration between nothing really moving on the climate front and enough and, you know, the conflict, the, 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 the paradox of getting all of this information on the me- and via media all the time about, you know, how dire it was, the ice cap melting, the you know, everything, everything, and just sort of seemed to be no, um, there seemed to be no, um, Uh, what's the word, Um, complimentary reaction to what I was receiving. So it seemed like my logic was just, I felt very on my own, like no one was really feeling kind of the panic that I was starting to feel from what I was getting. And then I had my first grandchild and I observed his wonder of the, of, of, of the world and his big blue eyes just looking at it and taking it all in and just loving it all. And I felt like I had this terrible secret that I wasn't able to tell him (laughs) about where his, you know, the challenge of his life ahead, if he was going to live for the next hundred years, um, it was not going to be all, all, all wonder and, and magnificence. And just, I think that paradox of, of knowing, of, of feeling such, um, the magnitude of it all, and I, I, you know, anyway, it just floored me, and I basically had a sort of mental breakdown over the whole thing, and um, just got into a very bad place, and didn't really know where to move or how to move forward. I felt enormous impotence, um, really, to affect any kind of change, and I think, you know, a lot of people were feeling the same, and particularly when I experienced the Black Summer fires, which I went, oh, this is. This is my first experience of an Australian bushfire. But then it went on and on and on and engulfed so many hectares. And, you know, the devastation, the loss of animals. Ugh. Anyway, so I got into a pretty bad place, which is good because I had my head cracked open. And that's often what happens when you get to a place of despair and you then you have to move forward. You either end it or you move forward. And I realized actually that I was very empowered because I then read a book by Charles Massey called Call of the Reed Warbler, which was an incredible, hopeful um, sort of Bible about what regenerative farmers were doing and how they were um, – and how they were changing their, 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 their method of farming, which was pulling a lot of carbon from the atmosphere. And I also re- realized, too, that farmers had been very responsible for the um, release of, of carbon into the atmosphere with all the tilling and the loss of soil and et cetera, et cetera. So I was then so galvanized by this book and also by my farm manager coming to me and saying that um, I have a small property up in up in the mid the mid north coast and he, and he's my neighbor and he basically was ca- keeping an eye on my cattle etc cetera, etc cetera. nothing no big enterprise or anything but he said this type of farming is done we can't aff- we, we can't it, it's not sustainable either e- economic financially or ecologically. And so the combination of that and reading Charlie Massey's book just made me so hopeful that there was an answer and that I could 
I could make positive change. And I could not only make positive change as a farmer, but as a filmmaker, because I could film what I what I was learning. And I could, and I was a consumer. So I could really pay attention to what I was buying, you know, the power of my dollar, how I could influence basically how our food was grown. And um, so that sent me off on this sort of path about three years ago. And uh, initially, I wanted to tell a story of all the farmers that, you know, the early impactors, the uh, the um, the early um, adopters who had been, you know, because some farmers have been doing this for 40 years in Australia, and they've had these incredible results. But um, it hadn't reached a critical mass yet that, you know, data was being collected and all of that. But now it has. And the data is just so overwhelmingly positive that, you know, obviously on this, on this, on this road, this path, I've just felt incredibly empowered and positive about how we can change things for the better. So does that give you a does that give you a good in? Definitely does, Rachel. I think one one thing that really struck me about the film is is you know the woman on the farm, like this piece, and it, you know it felt like this is a place where your kids had grown up, they'd ridden ponies, but your role, you know, as the mum, um, you loved this as a place. You were the one that organised the picnics and, and you know put pop the kids up on up on the ponies, but you didn't really engage with it as as land and as a tool for change. Can you talk? Talk about that that um, that transition that you that you made for your, for yourself, and, and you know, like to get, to go from that to like shaking flood grass off a fence. You know, it was um, yeah, really, really quite uh, quite a transformation. Um, yeah, look, I grew up in in the country in England. I grew up in the Cotswolds and um, um, amongst you know sheep, and we rode a lot, and you know, ch- sort of classic children's. Um, growing up in the country in England, ponies, ponies, ponies. And um, my dad had a, he was arable, he was an arable farmer. So we had a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, lot of life around the harvest and all that. So I'm very comfortable in the country and, you know, all around us were sheep farmers. And um, so it's in my blood and I, and I'm not, um, and I really am grateful for that because it, I, I see that people who grow up in the city, are not really, they're a little bit nervous of the country. They don't want to step into muddy dams. They're afraid of the bugs and the snakes and the, all of this sort of stuff. And and I kind of, I'm not. And so, but when I was growing up, all I saw on the land, you know, driving the tractors, making the decisions, um, you know, absolutely running it all were men. So I never considered, you know, the women, the wives were feeding the the potty calves or the lambs or, you know, and they did the books in the home and they looked after the children. I didn't see them having a particularly dynamic role on the farm. So when we came here, I didn't, you know, we were still very much in the entertainment industry. We bought a little farm. We had it so that we could take the kids so that, you know, I could mimic really what my upbringing was on a farm and, and introduce my kids to that. And, um, um, you know, we just had the farmer looking after our cattle. When we bought it, we had about 30 head of cattle and we gradually, you know, increased our, our, our land and, and our cattle. But really, it was a very informal relationship with the neighbor who was sort of managing the cattle and just making sure that, you know, they had something to eat. Um, and we had a little business with it, you know, just selling the cattle. So, you know, there wasn't really a role for me to play. I couldn't see a role. He was always on the, he was always on the tractor. He was always making the decision. His wife was doing exactly as I'd seen women, you know, uh, 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 farming wives growing up. She had a job in town, but, uh, and she was on the books and feeding the potty calves. Um, so I kind of um, didn't really see a role for myself until I read Charlie Massey's book, really. And then I went, this is so positive. And I was so inspired by what those farmers were doing. And it seemed very doable. It just seemed a very, a much gentler way of working with land. And, you know, there was no, you're not hauling around big, big um, um, things of, of chemicals. It's not brute strength that's needed. Yes, you have a tractor, but I can learn to drive that. Um, you know, I didn't, I actually saw, hey, I can participate in this. And my kids were grown up. So, you know, I had, I had the time to give it. And yeah, I guess. Um, so then I went, I can do this. And I mean, you know, 
having done it, I have a whole new respect for farmers and how hard they work and how varied their skills have to be. Um, but um, and I'm certainly not as good a farmer now as I am a filmmaker. But you know, so it's um, I'm a burden for Mick, really, my farm manager on the farm. But I I give it a go, and there's some things, you know, and I'm perfectly able to take over if he goes on holidays or you know he has to go away. So you know, although I wouldn't, I've got a long way to go to call myself a farmer. I'm I'm okay as a farm hand. You're a, a vegetarian, Rachel, a long a long time. Uh, avoider of meat, but you did have this cattle farm. I guess it, it seems like when you thought about doing things radically differently on the farm, getting rid of cattle seemed the obvious thing to do. But can you talk about the way that you were shown how to rethink the idea of these four-legged creatures? Yes, I very much bought into this fear of you know that, that cattle were part of the climate change problem, and um, you know one of the things that you know you want to do, you march when you can, you recycle, you go vegetarian, you listen to all the sort of all of the um, the fear mongering that goes on when you are uh, trying to do the right thing. And um, yes, I was very convinced that to not eat cattle was was the way to register my opposition to cattle on farm, and to, you know, too much um, eating eating meat was a bad thing. But really, being introduced to regenerative farming, I was to learn that actually cattle herbivores on the land are are good for the land. And okay, we didn't have them in Australia for many, many years, but we did have fire. And that has, you know, that is a human impact on the land. And, you know, and to a large extent, fire has been seen to be, you know, it puts the nutrients back in, it puts the nitrogen back into the ground. And in many instances, it keeps the it keeps the grass low and it helps us with our huge bushfires. But it also has a destructive element too. And I think anything that's overdone does. And, I, and I'm certainly one for not eating meat for every bloody meal. But I think there is a place for meat. And I think there are people who, you know, we are meaters. There are people who thrive on meat, who don't thrive when they are on, on vegetarian. And I don't see a time when we're not going to be meat eaters. So I feel that argument is, is thin. And um, when after reading Charlie's book and understanding really the part that, that, that ruminants play on the land, that they are constant, if you get it right, they move like a wild herd, which is constantly nipping, pooing and trampling the ground. And they cannot eat where they've pooed. So they have to move on, which means you never, you never get overgrazing when you get a, wild, a natural wild herd moving through the country, moving through the land. And of course, bison and buffalo have done this for eons. And this is the way they do it. And then they come back, you know, either seasonally or they come back a year later to the same spot and the grass is ready to be, to be nipped again. So the, the challenge for regenerative farming is to move our cattle around the land land that moves, that mimics nature. And so I, in my, in my farm, I had 30 paddocks. I now have 90 paddocks. So I'm doing something called timed grazing, which I measure the amount of grass I have. I, I know how much cattle I have. And then I have to time it to how much, uh, which, that, which sounds complicated, but it's actually not that complicated. So I then know how much grass I have in the paddock before the cattle will start overgrazing it. So I basically, in the winter, we move our cattle probably a probably about every three days. And in the summer, we move them very fast because we've got a lot of, 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 of very vigorous growing grass and, they, and it needs to be nipped all the time to keep it growing. Now, the great thing about this grass growing is it pulls carbon. We all know about trees pulling carbon, but actually pastures, prairies on a big scale pull so much carbon if they've got grass growing out of the atmosphere. And a lot of it is recycled, but a lot of it is stored in the, in it back into the ground. And the worst thing we've done with farming is that we have, um, we have overgrazed, we have overtilled, so we've lost it, we've dried out our paddocks, we've dried out our soil so that it becomes dirt, not soil. And that we lose all the microbes in it. And we and when you get the cattle or the ruminants nipping too far down, constantly nipping, which we've done with set grazing, which we've just done for years, because that happens to be the method that we took from Europe, we overgraze. And when we overgraze, we dry out the landscape and the soil blows away. So with this method, you just I mean, like with us, with the, we've got 
340 hectares between me and my neighbor where, where we um, rotate our cattle. So they don't come back until the grass has regrown and is ready to be nipped. So during that regrowing, all of that carbon has been pulled down and, you know, hopefully a lot is being stored back into the ground. Um, so, yeah, does that answer that question? Sure does. You, you touched on um, indigenous fire stick farming and you know the, the benefits that has for landscape. Can can you talk about your engagement with traditional owners and and what that's taught you about how to relate to land? Yes, I went to a. I happened to go to a council meeting that were looking for grants to do things on the land, and I can't remember why I was there. Why I was looking for a grant, but um, there was a. Um, oh, I know. I was doing something in the town in Maxville. I was trying to get. Um, a lot of the veranda posts put back onto the ha- onto the onto the to the town, and so I was there looking for a grant for for that for sort of um, beautifying the town. And uh, there was an Aboriginal group there who were looking for funding because they wanted to co- collect the original grass seeds and help put back the original grass because where we are, all of our grass is exotic. It all comes from other places or overseas. And um, and when I when I heard them asking, I went, "Oh God, you're exactly who I need to talk to about what was our original, what were our original grasses? Where are they? Can I get them back?" And um, so then I became friends with Kenny Walker, who was, was part of this indigenous group, and he came and and basically talked to me about what was of value on my land. You know, the kind of um, um, the shrubbery that was of value and, you know, fascinating talk about all the medical, all the medicine, all where they, where, all how they existed for many, many, many years on the land with the stuff that we now consider, you know, um, weeds or we consider, you know, we need to get rid of it and, and it's sort of not understanding the sort of holistic thing of, of, of country, understanding that everything works together. You know, it's all that the weeds are as important as the crops because, you know, very often my cattle will look for something if they're short of something, if they're short of potassium or they're short of sulfur or they're short of salt, they will source that in other in things other than the grass that, that is on my is on my land. So everything and of course it's it's feeding the bugs. Then you get a sort of understanding by talking to the indigenous people how everything is connected sort of kenny talked about that everything was a vein to the central body of something you know that that everything we all feed in and we all feed out of this uh, of this essential um sort of um essential life-giving body that is on the land and if you destroy parts of it and or 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 get rid of parts of it you are really cutting the ecology you are damaging the ecology or you are damaging the whole cycle of of water or of of minerals of carbon of uh, solar all of these things are interconnected and it sort of made great sense to me and it was incredible because actually regen farming comes originally from a, a south african guy called alan savory you know old white guy and his it came to him from his constant observation on the land in South Africa about the wild animals moving forward, uh, moving all the time and not overgrazing. And it's, you know, this these two, these two um, um, chains of thought have basically come together and completely, uh, completely um, reflect each other. So it's very much when he was talking, he could have almost been talking like an like a regen, you know, educator. He, all the things he was saying were exactly the same things as what I was learning through Charlie Massey and Call of the Rebobler and all of these all of these courses that I was doing on regen uh, farming. So there's a great synergy with the original way of farming and the farming that regenerative speaks about. And we have really got ourselves out of balance by this conventional and industrial farming that we're doing. And it's not sustainable. So we have to really think about changing our way of farming. Uh, there are lots of great moments in the film where you're like pondering the journey. One one moment that I love is where you say, sometimes I wish nature would bloody well speak up and tell me what she wants to do. Um, but then that's instantly followed by the reflection of, you know, maybe you just need to listen, listen to the quiet voices. Can you talk about that, that, that sort of relationship? 
Yeah, I mean, as Kenny said, Kenny Walker, the, my indigenous friend said, um, you know, you really have to be on country in order for country, to, in order to listen to country, because you have to be, you know, you have to be immersed in it. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm in and out. I mean, I'm still um, making, uh, I'm still a, a film director, so I go off and do work, uh, you know, million, I mean, I was just in, 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 um, uh, Broken Hill. So I was doing a lot of immersion in Broken Hill and listening to the country there. And you just need to be there to hear the, the different birds that are there, to be observing the different, you know, where a new channel has formed, where something might be eroding. So I need to deal with that. You need to, you know, you're observing the grasses. You're, you just need to be there, I think, to appreciate the subtle moves of nature. And I see it in my horses a lot, you know, how absolutely attuned they are to nature and what the weather that's coming. I mean, how they know when something is coming, you know, when I've got a front coming in. You just... Um, um, you know, we're all, we're so out of tune, really, it was particularly those of us living in the cities, so out of tune with the subtleties of nature. And we bloody have ignored it on land. And we don't understand how much it is all interconnected. We're so keen on getting the most out of our land and pumping in chemicals to make sure we get what we want out of the land. And, you know, it's done us very well. But we, it's not sustainable, and we are going to break down the chain, you know, the ecological chain that is vital for everything to be interconnected, and and it is all interconnected. And we're seeing, you know, the frightening thing of bees just um, disappearing, and those those that that data we have on how how few, how few bees we have now, and the dung beetles on the farm, where have they gone? My snakes aren't there anymore. Where have they gone? You know, and they all play a really important important role in the ecology of land. So we have to wake up and, um, and you know, start listening to what, um, uh, to what isn't there anymore and, and getting it back. And, you know, as you see in the film, nature's very quick to respond. If we start taking our foot off the neck of nature, she comes back very quickly. Um, so, you know, that's what I'm doing in the farm. And anyway, that's what the documentary attempts to talk about and to sort of see the journey that you go from having a, a, a pretty damaged um, um, piece of land where I was a very negligent custodian to actually going, okay, this is a responsibility and I have to take this responsibility seriously. So I'd love to hear more about the filmmaking process. I mean, you're, <laughs> you're the topic of the film, you're narrating the film, you're making the film. Can you talk about how you decided to start and, you know, what you filmed, what you didn't? What was the process like? Um, well, that was the sort of diff the hardest bit really because I was in a very low place at one point and I went, the only way I can do this is by taking one step forward at a time. I could see the mammoth journey ahead of me. And when you're in a in a place where you feel – uh, useless and um, you, it disempowered. It's very hard to sort of, you know, and I know so many of your listeners must have been in this place as well, that you just don't know what you can do to affect change that will uh, that will get you out of bed in the morning, really, or that give you a, um, give you a reason to get out of bed in the morning. And uh, so, I, I asked my daughter to bring her camera up over Christmas. She had a, um, she had a, a proper camera, a, a, a K4 camera that I could use to, and I'm, I'm, I'm a director, but I'm not good at working cameras. So everything was a battle. And I w looked at this camera case in the corner of my room for about two weeks and went, okay, this is the morning I'm going to get out. And I'm going to go out and talk to Mick and Normie, his farmhand, and talk to them about the regen process and just make a start. <coughs> And so I did. One day I bloody got up and I picked up the camera and I just went out and I started talking to them and I, everything was out of focus. All the sound was wrong. There were so many cicadas all over the track. I couldn't hear anything, but I'd taken the first step. And from taking that first step, I then found um, I then started to connect with all the farmers that I that um, were in the Inverell area. There were a lot of regen farmers in the up in the Inverell areas, and I started to ring them out of the blue and to say, "Hey, I'm thinking about doing a documentary. Can I come and talk to you?" And you know, obviously, it's of great um, it's of great help to me that you know 
people know when I'm calling, they've got a point of reference. Oh, yeah, we know she's in film. She's got to be legitimate. Otherwise, no, why would I have her poking around in my business? But anyway, I did go up and I learned a lot from these people and I got more and more excited about the whole thing. And um, and then I just was utterly convinced that this was the way to go. And and then I went, uh, then I found a Tina Dalton at Wild Bear that is a production company that is the biggest um, wildlife um, uh, documentary production agency in England, in Australia. And she said, yes, I do want to do this, but you have to be in it and you have to be central to the story. And I went, well, you've got about three, three minutes worth of chat. Well, you can see how that's changed three years later. I don't know anything. And I'm not, and I'm not a farmer, so I'm not doing anything on the land. What are you, what are you going to film? And anyway, so that basically forced me to really start um, participating on my farm and filming it at the same time. So part of the story, as you know, is the part of the relationship is with me and my um, my farm manager, which is um, was a bit of a shock to him to learn that he was going to have to have me as his farm farm hand. So that's part of the the humor, I suppose, of the film, because I'm not the best one. And um, yeah, so that's how um, how that all started. Yeah, that's really interesting because, I mean, some of the filming got pretty hairy, you know, like, yes, there were the fires, but then there were the floods as well. Um, yeah, so what I was doing was to, I was doing a film diary the whole way through. So for three years, I just took a diary. Whenever I went out with Mick, I would film something that was going on. So I was there when the floods were there and I was with him when we were dealing with the floods and I was there with the, with the buffalo fly crisis. And, you know, so although, uh, you know, and it was taken on my iPhone. I've got a, you know, it's K4 on your iPhone. So you, it's it's um, it's professional quality. So I could, um, even though the sound was no good, but because a lot of it was voiceover, because I'm interviewed throughout the whole throughout the whole series, um, um, I could use all of that footage. So that was, uh, and then also with I, there was another director involved when I did all my interviews and when we interviewed the um, uh, the other farmers and that sort of thing. So, yeah, so there was a bit of a combination between um, me and a director called Gisela Kaufman. That's so interesting. I mean, do you feel like, you know, in, engaging with it as a filmmaking process made you more accountable as a farmer? Well, yes and no. I mean, I think once you get, uh, no, I was accountable as a filmmaker that I did, would deliver something that uh, was, t- you know, A, targeted the right audience. I wasn't really speaking to farmers with this. I was wanting to speak to to the consumer. Um, I was wanting to, you know, to bridge that gap between city and country. I think there's a, you know, those of us who live in the city have really no idea what farmers do to produce our food. And we don't really, I mean, there's Landline, which is fabulous, but it's not on mainstream TV. You know, the sort of farmers have become, you know, they're so much part of the backbone of the history of this country, and yet they're quite invisible. You know, they just sort of get on with it. We don't really hear their stories very much. And I felt that that was, you know, there's so many of us out there. I felt that there was something lacking there. And also, it's such a iconic sort of ha- hard life, but such a romantic life. You know, it's uh, it's still got... It's still got all those elements that, you know, that our our country was, you know, the myth of our country, really. So, and that's still there, but we see it so rarely. And also the beauty of this country. I just wanted to bring some attention back to the beauty of of this country and how different it is, particularly for an uh, international audience. I wanted to see them. It's not just all flat red dirt, you know, like where my farm is. It's 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 very different. You know, it's very green. It's rolling hills. It's pastoral. It's um, you know, most people don't have an idea of Australia like that. We've got such variety. So I did want to capture that. And I did want to capture the life of, of, of farmers and how we produce food and how we, you know, the choices that are made about what gets on your, on your table. And I feel that that's, it's caught in a very, um, it's caught, it's in a very imprisoned state at the moment. And I feel that we need to really op- open that door where there's a lot of people who are very keen to have nutrient-rich 
food and are very keen to um, support best practice farming, who are, who are very keen to support animal welfare, you know, the best animal welfare. You know, the people and, – and there isn't really a market for that. You know, where do you go to a restaurant that you are guaranteed that the best animal welfare went into looking after the food on your plate? Or, you know, the best type of farming where they know that they're not going to get herbicides and pesticides all in their food. And why do people, why have we got this thing that we know pesticides and herbicides are all over, all over the land? Why do we not think it's getting into our food? Of course it is. Why do we think we've got this explosion of endocrine diseases that we, that we have and, you know, we're, we're, we're not a well society at the moment, you know, with all these, um, you know all of these things like ADHD and autism and and cancers and et cetera et cetera. You know this is linked to what we are putting on the land, and I think there's more and more data to show that. Um, we know that glyphosate has had a big, uh, you know, a big um, examination and a big rethinking of in the states, and there is, you know, like 400 million liters of glyphosate is poured onto the to the land in America every year. I mean, it's horrifying, and it's getting into our water systems, it gets into our air, and it certainly gets into the food that we're eating off that land. So we need a bit of a big rethink, and we need to, if we care, a lot of people you know, go, hey, listen, I'm perfectly healthy eating the food I've been eating all my life. I don't care. Fine. There's plenty of food for them to eat. But if you do care and if you, you know, you do, you are aware, want to be aware of the provenance of your food, you really need to not literally know your farmer, but you need to know where your food is coming from and you need to know what type of farming went into producing this food. It's, um, you've obviously gone on such a an educational journey with this, Rachel. It's it really, it's incredible. And I'm sure it felt like everything was happening very slowly at times, but it, it also looks like it happened quite quickly. It's, you know, th- three years, you've really turned it around. And as you say, nature does, um, I suppose, respond to the changes that we make as humans so so quickly and, and in such a heartening way. But it's, you know, you you'd frame the film you said you're at a low place and you frame the film with, you know, your daughter is crying as she talks about what a low place you were at. I mean, how do you reflect on your personal journey? You know, how do you, how did you feel then and how do you feel now? Um, oh, it's really hard to talk about your personal. I, I, I'm Not that I, I don't mind sharing my personal journey. It's just very hard to have a perspective on it. Um I'm a pretty active person. I like to be busy. I like to be involved. I like to be, uh, I need to be impassioned to get, to move forward. I can get into a slump quite easily. Um, And I'm not sure how to talk about this really, but I, I just feel very, I feel empowered. I feel like I've found something to, to, um, I feel like I f- there's a relevance in, 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 in this story and I feel it's, a, it's broader than – it's obviously much broader than me. I feel that it's um, – you know, I feel very lucky that I had the land and that I had this epiphany and that I had this head-cracking moment and that I was taken down this, this path. In a funny way, sometimes I think, you know, because when I started the documentary, I didn't have a third act. I mean, I basically had a vague story about where I was going. And I was just, you know, hoping that Tina was right, my producer that, you know, who'd done a lot of documentaries and said, you'd be surprised how the third act appears, you know, or you find the story that, you know, and I didn't know what the third act was going to be. Was I, was I going to be inundated with dung beetles or was I going to be have to give it all up? Or you know, I didn't know. And then without giving the story away, something happens that gives me the third act. And I went, whoa, this is, is this divine provenance? This is like, you know, I've really felt that this story uh, wanted to get out of there, wanted to get out and wanted to reach an audience. Because I felt that something was on side me telling this story, and you know, and maybe my crash was meant to be. I don't know. You just follow, 
you follow your heart, don't you? You follow you follow what makes you follow your logic. And my logic was telling me something was very out of balance and that I needed to throw myself into something to to do whatever I could to um to help with rebalancing this thing. And that didn't mean just going on as I had been going on, you know, in entertainment and just telling the odd, the odd the entertaining story. I felt because of my grandson, I felt more compelled to do something more urgent. Yeah, that that really comes across. Um, so the, the film is out on August 3, but Rachel, you and I are appearing in conversation at a screening on Sunday, the 6th of August at Village Cinemas Rivoli in Camberwell in Melbourne. But it's an incredible panel. Um, you're, uh, you're there with Yost Bakker, Monique Ryan, Mari Lowe's um, and myself doing a, like, trying to wrangle um, your, this incredible panel in conversation. I can't wait. So what I will say before we get off the food thing that my daughter is now in this space and having having stuck her ear, her fingers in her ears for many years about this she has now and her and her and her husband who has always been very pre- provenance uh, into the provenance of his food and he's a he's a health coach um, they now have the good farm shop and theirs is a whole journey in a in, in story in itself but they now have ready meals of which my husband calls lazy meals which are absolutely you know uh, the best raised cattle uh, from best practice farms everything is organic in it so that um, you know for people who do want to access that food they're starting in this market they're starting and they're obsessed as well so I was very glad to see that my daughter you know saw the sense in this and um, and has gotten into this th- this uh, this space that's amazing I think it also really speaks to you know, I think what I see in your story is you start where you are. Like you had this farm, you had a, you had this sense of cri- crisis and impotence, but you started where you were and made change. And I guess I see that as well with the Good Farm Shop, where it's like, okay, what what can I do? I can do this. And I think that's the question that you pose for all of us. You know, where are we? Where do you know? Where do we start? We start here, um, and that I think is where empowerment begins. Yeah, I mean, she went to grant to a thing with Groundswell up to the Barrow Reef, and was and and I think Tim Flannery or someone was there, and she got activated by that. I mean, she went right. I cannot. I cannot continue in the entertainment industry. I have to participate in this, you know, in the well-being of, of, of wherever I can in the well-being of this country and um, sorting it out. You know, sorting out where we've gone with our, with our, um, you know, just trying to cha- turn this huge boat around from where it's going, and um, and and she has. Mm, I guess, yeah, we've all got a paddle. We just need to... We've all got a paddle and we think it's incredibly ineffective to start with. And it's, you know, but as I say in the film, I know my farm is not going to change the world, but if all of us do a little bit, we can. And, it, you know, sometimes that little bit is just about being aware about where your food cr- comes from and making the effort to support a system that is um, that is going to help the ecology rather than supporting a system which is plundering our, our, our ecology. Um, so that's, you know, it's a simple choice. And God knows I don't do it all the time. I try my, I try my best. There's, I have great moments of weakness and I don't think we have to do it relentlessly. But if we're constantly asking those questions like, okay, I'd like an egg and bacon sandwich, please, but where is this bacon? Where did you get this bacon? Is it is it bacon from pigs that are brought up in, you know, horrible stalls where they can't turn around? Or is this free range? You know, okay, I'd love a steak and chips. Is my, is my steak grass fed and finished? You know, those are certain things that you can and we need to know, we need to find out more about labeling too when we when look at what's in it and be very careful about what's in it because um it's all adding it all adds up and uh we can do it right we can we can do it right and but it needs it needs um consumer pressure the retailers will change the farming will change if the consumer demands it and but the consumer has to demand it um, fantastic, Rachel. Such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you for sparing the time and I'll see you on August 6th. Okay, look forward to it. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. Bye. 
This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This.